New year, new decade, and a brand new chapter for church. You guys are moving into a whole new deal. You're, a, you're at a new zip code, a new, uh, a new address. Something new is getting ready to happen. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today as you get ready, as you are on the precipice of something awesome. I have selected my text from 2 Kings chapter 6, and it says this, the company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. And one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees, and one of them was cutting down a tree, and an iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. And the man of God asked, where did it fall? He showed him the place. Elisha cut a stick and threw it there in the iron, and it made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. The story takes place surrounded by a problem. This place where we meet with you is too small for all of us. That's a problem. This place is too small for us. What a great reminder that some problems in life are good. You need to make sure that when you're in the middle of a problem, that you give God enough time to, to develop it to find out if this is a good problem or a bad problem. Is this a good thing? Is this something good that's going to take place? The place has gotten too small. This passage starts with a problem. There's just not enough room to meet, and there's not enough room to function. There are a lot of things going on. There's so many people. It's a time of growth. It's a time of expansion, and it results in a shortage of space. What a great problem. This is the kind of problem every pastor prays for, is that we've got too many people we can't fit into our facility. This is the kind of problem that you're experiencing. There's a problem around here that demands that you look outside this facility and you start looking for a new place to meet. This is cause for celebration. What an interesting thought that some problems in your life and my life, my life lead to celebration. We see it clearly. What a great problem. We like it. We see this problem as God's blessing and as God's favor. We see the good problems as a door opener of opportunity into a brand new year. I want to remind you something about the principles in God's Word. They're not just applicable to congregations. They're not just applicable to families. They're applicable to individuals. And everything we would ever say to a local assembly, we would also say to an individual. There are some problems that are going on in your life that God intends to bless you greatly as a result of what it is that you're walking through. Not every problem in your life can be categorized as a negativity. You sit here today in a church that is healthy. You sit here today in a church that is strong. You sit here in a church today that has growth. It's a sign of God's blessing, and it's a sign of God's provision. But it all started in Pastor Dave's heart in a time of quiet prayer and meditation quiet time with God. And then it expanded to a boardroom where this vision was discussed and where it was prayed about. It started because there were too few classrooms and too few seats and way too few parking spots out there. Every time I come here, it's like I feel guilty for taking a parking spot because there are so few of them. And then when church lets out, I always linger because some of you are, are California drivers. I mean, to the, to the very core. And I just like to let the parking lot empty before I try to get my car out of the few parking spots. Today, the celebration that's going on in this place and the celebration that goes on next week is you eat spaghetti in a new spot. That's all made possible because of a problem. All of that is celebrated because of a problem. The second thing I want you to see in this passage is God's solution to a problem always includes you and I working. A lot of times when we pray about problems, we say, God, why don't you just? 
and we tell God what to do. And God looks back at us and says, I went way out of my way to create this problem specially for you. Go to work. It's your turn. I already did what I'm going to do. I created a problem for you. Now you go to work. And we go to prayer and we say, oh God, I have this problem. Would you just? Why don't you just? God, can't you just? Wow. Blessing's tremendous. Let's go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to live. And he said, go. Isn't it amazing the consistency of God? How he gives these one word answers? Go. Wow. Now the only thing that you can do is go. Jesus says to Peter, come. The only thing Peter has left to do is decide whether he's going to come or not. Just these one word commands are unbelievable. And in this one, it's just time to go. But more often than not, God's blessing also includes a lot of extra effort and energy expended on our part. Yes, there's growth. Yes, the place had grown too small. Yes, there was blessing. But the result of that is going to be people going down to a river and there being some work being done to be able to resolve that. I think it's interesting today that Pastor Dave asked you to put on some clothes that you don't mind getting dirty and coming down to the new facility and working. And some of you are like going, well, why would we do that? Because God's blessing you with a problem. And so now it's time for us to do our part and to do the work. You see, I was at your facility a couple of weeks ago and I walked it with your pastor. And there were bare studs. And there were broken things in the ceiling. And there were wires hanging down. And Dave kept saying to me, hey, be careful there. Don't step on that. Hey, walk around that. Hey, make sure you don't... I'm like going, man, I'm taking my life in my hand work walking through this place. But as we walked through this liability factory that Dave had taken me to before we went to lunch, he says, this is what's going to go here. And this is going to be this way. And this is going to be this way. And I'm looking at dirt. And I'm looking at wires. And I'm looking at broken stuff. And he is looking at it completely different. He is looking at it through the eyes of vision about how it's going to be. Wow. I'm going, really? That's going to be there. Really, that's going to be there. See, that's how you know God's speaking to you is because you see things that only God can do through you. There was work in the boardroom. There's been work in the prayer room. There's also going to be work in the structure. Many of you are going to expend extra effort during this process. Some of you have given extra dollars during this process to make sure that this celebration can take place. That's the way it works. God blesses us and we work. There is always a combination of God doing His part and you doing your part. Where we get into big, big trouble in our Christian walk is that we ask God to do our part and we think we can do God's part. Just let God do His part. God will never do your part. And God will never ask you to do His. Let God take care of the miraculous. Let God take care of the supernatural. Let God take care of the big picture. And you work obediently to the opportunities that He presents very carefully right in front of you. Work is part of Christianity. We're not saved by works. We are saved by grace. But our response to God's will and God's blessing is the work of ministry. Look at what Jesus said about work in John 9, 4. As long as it is day, we must do the work of Him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. It doesn't mean that something's broken in the church when there's work to do. What it means is that you are doing the will of the Father when there is work opportunity available to you. This is what Paul said about work. 
It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Wow. The reason the fivefold ministry gifts exist is to get people ready to work. Work is not a dirty word. Work is a four letter word, but it's not a bad four letter word. It's a great word when it comes to ministry. God's blessing should result in the work of ministry being done. If it doesn't, then you are acting like God blesses you just for you. And God never blesses you just for your own well-being, not as an individual or a family or as a church. God blesses you so that you can do something for God's kingdom through the blessing that he's entrusted to you. Third point is this. The people in this story know that the solution will include God's presence. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them. And they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. One of them, as he is given the command, go, stops and says, hey, is there any way while we're going, while we're going to work, while we are taking advantage of this blessing and fixing this problem, is there any way that you as the man of God would please join us? They want God's presence in their endeavor. What a great decision. Moses puts it this way. This is in Exodus 33. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. We have gotten in the church way more concerned about programs than presence. We've gotten way more concerned about style than presence. And I will tell you what will cover a multitude of sin in programming and in stylistic issues is the presence of God. When the presence of God shows up, all of a sudden, everything gets better. You give me an old barn with no amenities and the presence of God, and people will come. People are hungry to have a legitimate encounter with the presence of the living God. Don't forget in your life to enjoy the presence of God. I get asked a lot in my life, how long should we pray? My answer to that question is always very simple. My rule of thumb on prayer is I pray until I feel God's presence. And when I'm out of alignment and I'm out of whack and my attitude is messed up, it takes a lot longer for me to feel God's presence. And when I'm living in communion with God and I'm walking in agreement with God and I am pursuing the things of God in my life, I feel God's presence so much easier and so much quicker than when I'm out of alignment. And God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means He's in the same spot all the time. When it takes me longer, it's because of a misalignment and a change in me. I would encourage you to make sure that you don't start days, not without prayer, but without the presence of God. Don't just start your day without your devotions. Don't just go aimlessly through the, moment, through the motions of prayer and Bible study and devotion. Have some time where you actually allow God's presence to invade your space before you go out and face the day. They need poles. They need work to be done. They have a problem to solve. And somebody wisely says, let's make sure we don't embark upon this endeavor without the presence of God being with us. The fourth thing is this. Doing the work of God with the presence of God does not mean there will be no problems. There's still going to be problems even if the presence of God is on it and you are fulfilling the will of God and you are walking in the middle of God's blessing. He went with them. They went to the Jordan, began to cut down trees, and as one of them was cutting down a tree, an iron axe head fell into the water. Oh my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. 
people are interesting. Earlier, there's a problem that they experienced, and it's a very, very good thing. Now there's panic and there's fear as a result of a problem. Problems can get entirely different sets of reactions. What you need to understand is that God is engaged fully in any kind of a problem you ever encounter as a church, as a family, or as an individual. If it's a problem uh, surrounded by the blessing of God, God's in it. And if there's a problem that happens and it's not because of, of blessing, it's because of an accident or a problem or somebody's carelessness, God is still in the middle of it. This problem gets a different kind of reaction. But just remember that problems are not an indicator that God has left the project. The man of God didn't say, oh, and things were going so well. Oh, and we had the favor of God. Oh, and we had the blessing of God. And now look, the axe head has been broken off and it's lost. Obviously, God has changed his mind. Obviously, we have lost the favor of God. Obviously, somehow we fell out of the will of God in this project because the axe head's in the water. Uh, I quit. You should all quit. Let's go back to the small place. Problems are not an indicator that God has quit on you. Problems are something that Jesus guaranteed. I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, this next promise is not one of my favorites. As a matter of fact, I have searched multiple studies of different translations to try and see if it got translated differently because I don't even like it. But the reason that Jesus said these things was to give us peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I don't like that Jesus promised we would have trouble. Somehow we have become convinced in the church that if God is in it, there will never be a problem. That, that sells books. That sells podcasts. That fills stadiums. It just isn't biblical. Abraham encountered a drought when he was in the center of God's will. Moses was opposed by the people that God asked him to lead. And he was pleasing God, and the people spoke ill of him and to him. Daniel prayed and was thrown into a lion's den. They said, Daniel, no more prayer. And he goes, I have to go home and pray about that. <laughs> Jesus was hungry and tempted while praying and in the center of God's will. Jesus was abandoned and killed in the center of God's will. Peter was crucified in the center of God's will. Paul was beheaded while writing scripture that would encourage you and me. He was in the center of God's will and he was beheaded. Trouble. Problems occur even when you're in the middle of God's will. But in the midst of God's will, when there's problems, there's always God's provision. Always. Nobody should ever walk out of this place feeling that if you're in the center of God's will, you'll have no problems. And nobody should ever say to anybody else, if they're having a problem, you're obviously missing it with God. Because you have a problem. Problems will be met by God's provision every single time. The man of God asked, where did it fall? And he showed him the place, and Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. And the man reached out his hand and took it. In the middle of the story, the man of God asks a question. Where did it fall? He cut a stick, he threw it in, and the iron axe head floats to the surface. There's much said about this particular statement in Scripture is debated openly if iron actually floats. I don't know why we have so much trouble with that. I was just down in San Diego and the harbor is full of steel ships called aircraft carriers that are floating. <laughs> the point is not if iron can float. The point is that God provides help 
when you encounter problems when you're in the center of God's will. God's will is not fragile. God's will is something that He has in mind and in place for you. We have made God's will like, a for, like, like this little tightrope type of an existence where you're doing everything you can to heal and tow your way through God's will and making sure that you don't do anything to fall out of God's will. God, God's will is not like a tightrope. God's will is more like a four-lane freeway. There's great liberty in it. There's great freedom in it. There's great access. There's great, there's great understanding. And every now and then you run into a sign that says like Sacramento, and you know you're headed towards Sacramento. That's how God's will works. It's not easy to fall out of God's will when you love God and you want to please Him. It's the easiest thing in the world to be in the center of God's will. We are so convinced that every time something negative ever happens in our life, that God has left the building, that He's folded up shop, and that somehow we have fallen out of God's will. Friends, you can be in the center of God's will and have difficulty, and it doesn't mean that God's mad at you, that He hates you, and that He's got it in for you. You can be in the center of God's will, and sometimes it's to put you in a situation so that God can show off to you about what He's capable of doing. How boring would this story have been if they all just went down and cut down poles and built a new church? There's a problem and God is going to show off in the middle of the problem because that's what God does for people who are at the center of His will and a problem occurs, God shows Himself to be God. Abraham was delivered from the famine. God sent manna to help Moses and his people who were hungry. The three Hebrew children walk into a fire and they come out not smelling like smoke. Daniel was not eaten by the lions. He spent the entire evening with them. Them on their side of the room and him on his side of the room. There was no problem in the lion's den. Jesus resisted the temptation. And Jesus was raised to life after he was betrayed and crucified and killed, he came back to life. And Peter and Paul's influence lives to this day, even though both of them were martyred. God always has the last word on the problems that we encounter in our lives, and in our leadership, in our families, in our homes, in our churches. Faith in God is a big deal when we're having a problem. As a matter of fact, Scripture will just simply say that without faith, it is impossible to please God. There are some things that you will never be able to accomplish in your life apart from faith. I pray that you would never be able to take over a new facility without your faith being stretched. Why? Because if God's in it, then faith is demanded. Every time God's in it, faith is, faith is demanded because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot accomplish something that pleases Him without there being faith demanded. The good news is this. Every one of you is loaded with faith. Every one of you has faith built into you. You have faith. You exercise faith on a regular basis. Your faith level is incredible. You're sitting in chairs that you never even wondered if they were going to fall from underneath you. There's a roof over the top of you that none of you have even given a second thought to. Some of you went to McDonald's this week. You drove up to the drive-thru. You started talking to that little box. The kid on the other side of that box missed your order up three times. He couldn't get it right. You got to the window. He can't count change. And he forgot two things out of your order, which was just a number one. And as soon as you get done with proven incompetence in the store, you open the thing and put it in your mouth because you have faith that it's going to be okay. You are people of great faith. Romans 12.3 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Now, that is not exclusive. That is not exceptional. It's said to everyone. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself in sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. 
you. If God's going to say without faith it's impossible to please me, then it only stands to reason that God's going to turn around and put a measure of faith into every one of us to give us the ability to please Him. God would never ask for you to use something that pleases Him and not also give you that thing to be able to please Him. God gives to each of us a measure of faith. You don't need more faith. God already gave you a measure of faith that is equivalent to every task He's ever going to bring to you, every opportunity He's ever going to bring to you, every circumstance, every problem, every situation. You come equipped from the factory with the element of faith that God determined in advance that you need. You don't need to go out and find more faith. You don't need to walk out of here today feeling guilty about your faith level. Your faith level is fine. It's just exactly the way God determined it in advance when he built you he put an element of faith into you go ahead and exercise the faith that god has given you some have greater faith yes but that is because god has things mapped out for them that they're going to need greater faith use the faith you have and don't get onto a guilt trip about not having enough faith to be able to please god Every time we run into a problem, we get to be dependent upon God. The greater the task, the greater the dependency. The greater the opportunity, the greater the dependency. Far more people turn from God over success than failure. Far more people walk away from God because their character can't handle success as well as their character can handle another problem. Problems have the ability to keep us grounded and keep us centered. Problems are what keep us in prayer. Problems are what keep our ears sensitive to God's voice. The, the issue here is viewing problems correctly. Problems and blessings. They're like railroad tracks running through your life. There's always going to be the blessing of God and there's always going to be problems in your life. And they run side by side the entirety of your life. You're experiencing God's blessing right now. Praise God. The favor of God has created the right kind of problems for you. Praise God. You have responded to the blessing of God with effort. Good for you. There are great days ahead of this church. Praise God. But there are also problems that lie in your path. You know, the children of Israel, after they crossed the Red Sea, God said he was going to take them the long way around because if they tasted battle too soon, they would go back to Egypt. There's an important truth in that. That when you encounter the problems you're going to encounter, the timing is God's. And when you run into a problem, you need to remember this. When you run into a problem, it's the right time and you are exactly who you need to be as a church, as a family, as an individual to handle the problem when it happens. It isn't just bad luck. It's actually, it's the timing because God knows exactly who you are and exactly what you're able to handle and exactly what can be done. If you'll lean on him with dependency and with faith, you'll make it through those problems. There are problems ahead, but I want to tell you when you encounter him, the timing is absolutely the children of Israel would encounter battles, but the timing of it is what God was watching. All things work together for good. Those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Called. I'm back where I started. The call of God. The call of God on this church is to go. The call of God on you might have been established when you were six or seven or eight years old a children's camp. And I want to remind you that call of God is irrevocable. May you go in faith. May you go in confidence. And may there be great victory ahead of you as you encounter the problems at the time that God allows them to come into this equation. Let me pray for you one more time.